12 years ago, I was almost 50 pounds heavier than I am today. I was suffering from sleep apnea, low energy, and I had some other health problems. It was time to get help, and I reached out and found an international organization that specialized in a program to help you lose weight. They would provide tools and support for me along with my journey. One of the tools was a paper slider. And the slider was a simple tool. You could go to the grocery store and pick up a package of food and using the tool, calculate a number of points that that certain food item was worth. It calculated it based on a combination of the portion size, of the calories, and the amount of fat and fiber within that food. To lose weight was simple. All you had to do was monitor and lower the amount of points that you ate in an individual day. On my first day in the program, I ate my maximum limit of points by lunch. <laughs> now, the great thing about the program was that you could eat as many fruits and vegetables as you wanted for free within reason. So my first night, I ate an entire can of sauerkraut for dinner. I can remember the sound of the tin hitting the back of the recycling bin when I threw it into it. I went to bed that night. I actually sobbed myself to sleep. <laughs> I was frustrated, and I was hungry. Now, I woke up the next day, and I decided that I needed to learn how to eat differently in order to survive this program and achieve my goals. So I did what I thought any rational human being would do. I took my paper slider, I jumped in the car, and I drove to a grocery store the moment that it opened. And I remember walking up to aisle one, bottom corner, and I picked up the first can of food and my slider, and I calculated the number of points that that item was worth. I made a note in my journal, and I put the can down, and I picked up the next one. I repeated that process for more than 10 hours. I then did that for three more days. It was quite an amazing time, and I remember feeling at the end of it all, I felt empowered that I had figured out what I could eat. And I came to the realization that I would never have to eat food without a label ever again. Back then, I thought I learned three things about myself and about food. Number one, I'm mildly obsessive. <laughs> Number two, as long as I was okay with eating the results of a mathematical equation, I could be both happy and healthy. And number three, the grocery store was a virtual horn of plenty with almost unending options. I remember taking a look at the, the points the next day and, and using my knowledge, and I lost almost 50 pounds of the program. It took me another seven years before I read the rest of the ingredients or the rest of the writing on, the, on a food package. I started to read ingredient labels and I became confused. Let me join you in that confusion. Let's play a game. Let's guess what food product this is. <laughs> yep, it's a vegetarian pizza. There are at least 43 ingredients in this pizza, and it may contain up to four more. They're not really sure. <laughs> We eat it. <laughs> now, if this slide proves one thing, it's this. I'm not the only one that's eaten the output of a mathematical equation. Now, perhaps pizza is too easy. It's junk food after all. So let's head to the organic section of the grocery store and take a look at another label. At least I can pronounce all of these ingredients, but why is grape juice the number one ingredient in strawberry jam? Now, <laughs> but we eat it. <laughs> Let's take a look at, at a third and final example. In this case, there are 25 ingredients 
in a hamburger patty. Now, I don't know about you, but when I make the meat for my hamburgers, I tend to use less than 25 ingredients, and I don't add water. Now, hamburger patties aren't the only offenders. It blows my mind to realize that there are 15 ingredients in 100% pure beef hot dogs. Now, before we continue, let's take a look at, at one of these specific ingredients on the list. Do you notice that it contains natural flavors? <laughs> what the heck are natural flavors? <laughs> Have you ever gone to the discount aisle and tried to buy a pound of natural flavor? <laughs> so, allow me to introduce two of those flavors to you. I think they're pronounced castorium and cochineal. B but what are they? Castorium. <laughs> Yum O! <laughs> Beaver anal <laughs> gland juice. Now, in fairness, it's not used that often in food anymore, but it has been used for more than 80 years. It is a natural ingredient, and it is used. It tastes like raspberry or vanilla, I'm told. <laughs> Cochineal. Hmm. To make cochineal, you simply get a bug from South America. You crush it. And it's a wonderful ingredient to be used as a dye within food. It made international headlines in 2012 when a giant coffee chain, that one, admitted that they used it in their iced strawberry frappuccinos. And they're not the only one. It's a fairly common ingredient within the food industry. Now, there are alternatives to eating bugs and beaver bums. <laughs> the first one is a bunch of chemicals and synthetic ingredients, and the second is using the actual ingredients. See, my real problems with most grocery stores and our commercial food system isn't that we're eating insects and rodents. My real problems are three. Number one, many of our grocery stores sell endangered species of animals. They also sell animals that are so poorly treated in some cases that many of us would consider abusive. And even the vegetarian options are created while they harm our planet. Number two, grocery stores won't sell ugly vegetables. They blame you for insisting that you want perfectly beautiful food. Up to 30% of the food produced in this country rots because it's deemed too ugly to eat. Too ugly to eat. The third reason that I don't, I have some struggles with the grocery store is they're an exercise in human isolation. We trudge through neon lit aisles often armed with our iPods to protect us. We're bombarded with advertisements and health claims. You see, groceries for many of us are an ugly errand that actually separate us from the rest of our lives. Now, to be clear, I do shop at grocery stores from time to time. Not all of my food choices are sustainable, ethical, or healthy. But I just think that we can do better than this. Farmers markets offer an alternative to the grocery store environment. Instead of being a busy errand that we squeeze into lives, they actually become a family-friendly community event that it just so happens that we can also do our groceries in. While I spent more time at farmers markets, I spent a lot of time talking to farmers, to bakers, to, to all sorts of people who produced food and I asked them all sorts of questions. Remember that little mild obsession? And I learned a lot about my food and where it came from. 
The problem was so bad that many of my friends actually teased me that I must be dating my butcher and cheating on him with my cheesemonger. While walking through farmer's markets, I noticed from time to time people buying large quantities of food and taking it home to preserve. Being obsessive, I bought a flat of strawberries, and with my partner Dana, we drove to the suburbs to my parents' house with one mission, to have them teach us to learn how to make strawberry jam. Incidentally, it includes three ingredients. We were shocked by how easy it was to make jam. If you can boil water, you can preserve food. It's ironic with time that I now view strawberry jam as the gateway drug to the preserving culture. <laughs> 18 months later, the addiction had fully set in. By that point, we were living with over 600 jars of preserves in our downtown apartment, and just as surprised as you were. And Dana decided to launch a website about our adventures. Somehow, I got a little obsessive, I know that's a shock by now, and I ended up writing about it for 1,500 consecutive days. In that time, I became, became aware of food like I had never been before, despite reading all the labels. And in those four years, everything in our life directly changed because of it. Our jobs, what we ate, and our circle of friends. Preserving connected us to family, friends, and community in ways that we could have never imagined. When I started preserving, I thought it was just about making jams and pickles. And while we still make jams and pickles, we've learned that there's more than eight different ways to preserve food. And instead of just making condiments, many of the ingredients we make actually become the main star of dishes that we eat throughout the winter. There are five reasons why people tell me that they don't preserve food. The first one, is I don't know if I like it. Now, that's fair. We don't know if we like things that we haven't eaten. So let's start with an informal quiz and a show of hands. How many of you like one of any of the following ingredients? <laughs> Beer, wine, cheese, they're all preserves. And nearly 100% of you, except for that guy, are already eating preserves. We just don't think of it that way. The second reason why people tell me that they don't preserve food is that they don't know how. My good friend G.I. Joe said that knowing was half the battle. <laughs> so, let's start with a knowledge quiz and see where your knowledge is about preserving. By a show of hands, how many of you know how to use a fridge or a freezer? You see, we already all preserve food. Just nobody told us. <laughs> Preserving food can be just as easy as using your fridge. Let me give you one example. To preserve herbs in the fall, it's as simple as going out to your garden, cutting them off, coming back to your kitchen, and hanging them to dry. You can use them throughout the winter. A lot better than $6 a jar. The second example with preserving would be fermenting sauerkraut. Again, three ingredients, salt, water, cabbage. You mix the ingredients together, cover them with a cloth, and leave it in a warm spot in your kitchen until it tastes suitably sour to your likings. Now, once it's done, you just move it to the fridge. It will last for months or even longer in that, in that form. Um, oh, I went backwards. Next reason, I don't have enough time to preserve. My grandmother raised six kids in a two-bedroom house. Most of that time, or not most, but much of that time she spent alone. My grandfather was in the military or on cargo ships. She used a cold cellar to preserve her vegetables from her garden. She didn't do this because she had an abundance of free time. Each fall, I find myself migrating back to the suburbs. Dana and my parents, we preserve 120 to 150 jars of tomato sauce. It takes one to two days. And while that may seem like a lot of work, I now think of it as a family event that we enjoy together. But even more important, 
That forms the absolute basis of more than 80 of our meals through the rest of the year. I don't preserve food because I have an abundance of time. I preserve food because I don't. The next reason why people tell me that they're scared of preserving is it could cost a lot of money and it's too expensive. In the United States, on average, we throw out $48 billion worth of food. The average single family home in Toronto will waste more than 600 pounds of food in the next 12 months. Now, the first step to reducing our waste would be to buy less. But once you have it in your house, by learning preserving techniques, you can further reduce the impact by learning how to keep that food. And the economic impact for us isn't limited just to reducing waste. A great example of saving money while preserving is the simple act of preserving peppers. In the fall, you can buy a bushel of red peppers for less than $1 per pound. We preserve them very simply. We put them on the barbecue and char them. We remove the seeds and the skins and freeze them for use throughout the winter. Now, we eat on average one pepper per week, plus or minus, and that single task takes us one hour and saves us $100 per year. And that's only peppers. The last reason why people say is, it's too difficult, I'm not good enough, I'll never be able to figure this out. And since we have an entire minute left together, <laughs> why don't we do a course on preserving right now? Imagine in my left hand, I have a jar that is full of blueberries from the market. You can still buy them right now. And in my right hand, as I'm apt to have, I have a bottle of gin. <laughs> These blueberries are destined to last less than a week in my fridge or on my cupboard. By the simple act of pouring the gin onto the blueberries, I've now created two different preserves. I can sit it on my shelf, it will, it will last for over a year. I'm left with some great boozy blueberries. <laughs> Best muffins you'll ever wake up to. <laughs> and you can strain it, and you can have a blueberry-infused gin and tonic. You see, when it comes to preserving, I'm not talking about new technology, and I'm not talking about high technology, but I am talking about something that's proven, and I am talking about technology. We live in very complex times. We face food-related challenges today that we couldn't have even imagined a generation ago. But just because we have new problems, it doesn't mean that we need new answers. In some cases, and in the case of preserving, yesterday's technology is applicable today. The next time that you have a meal, should be shortly, I'd like you to look at your plate and ask a question. Are you eating an endangered species, an abused animal, a bug, a piece of beaver ass, The results of a mathematical equation, are you eating simple ingredients? I won't judge you for your answer, but I hope that some of you will find it in you to join people from all over around the world who are having a heck of an adventure by preserving whole food, by cooking with simple ingredients, and fighting their way back into the kitchen. And when you do, I will see you there. <laughs>